Um, now, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be sharing today, I have put it in a Python notebook. And I just put the link to that um, and all the sort of sample data sets that you might need to use to make that work in the chat. So let's just start by sharing the screen. And hopefully everyone can see my screen. I might need a verbal confirmation because I can't see anyone's faces at the moment. We can see your, I can see your screen all Great. good. <laughs> Great, thanks a lot. So um, there's a lot of different material that I want to cover today, and I'm not sure we'll necessarily get through all of it. Um, and that's why I've put it all in a Python notebook so that um, if we don't get through it, it's still there and you can still look through it. And if there's anything that is not clear or understandable, you can always um, contact me um, for further explanation or maybe then we need to do um, advanced plotting round two or something like that. Um, when it comes to plotting, um, I'm only, mainly just saying this for all the, the ECRs who are sort of early in their research um, careers. It's a skill that you'll um, acquire and you'll finesse with, with, um, with time. And what can make that easier is if you've got some um, good examples to go by, um, you've got um, good feedback from your peer network, your supervisors, your collaborators, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm always revising my own code. And um, I thought I would just start by, by sharing an example here um, of two um, plots here. They're both showing um, the topographic um, profile, topographic heights rather, um, from uh, a model that I use regularly in my own research. And the first one, the one on the left here, um, I created that using a different programming language called NCAR command language with the acronym NCL. And, um, and the one on the right is, is one that I've generated um, using Python and it's actually uh, a figure that I've put into a paper that's currently in review. There's a lot of differences between them, but there's also some elements that are really the same. Um, some of the elements that are the same in that I've used uh, the same sort of colour scheme to um, depict the topography. Um, I've put the oceans in blue. Um, I've used a discrete colour bar rather than a continuous one, but there are some differences as well. Um, the one on the left here, um, the text in all these labels looks a little bit fuzzy, which is personally quite irritating now with all our high resolution screens that we're using. Um, but also that I've used a con um, filled contours to produce this map. So everything looks sort of smooth. It's still blocky around the coast. But in the one um, on the right here, I've used... Um, something called p-color mesh in Python. And so each pixel is colored rather than using a filled contour. Um, people have different preferences as to whether they'll use filled contours um, or p-color mesh. In some ways, because I'm working here with gridded data, it's a bit more appropriate probably to use something like p-color mesh. Um, I could spend a lot of time criticizing um, the one on the left, but something that I want to say to all you um, early, early career researchers is that um, despite my critiques of this figure, it's still a figure in a pub publication of mine. In fact, it's the first paper I ever published. So even though um, looking back on it now, I might cringe, um, it still was good enough to meet publication standards, even though that's something that's constantly um, evolving. So hopefully you can gauge between the two plots themselves that there's been a wealth of improvement there's probably still more to go. Um, and that's something that I'm working on myself in my own time. Now, we're quite fortunate that when it comes to plotting, there's a whole wealth of material out there. In fact, sometimes um, one could argue that there's maybe too much and you don't know where to start. Um, the CMS team, they actually maintain a blog. And on this blog are a number of different posts about different plotting techniques. And I would strongly encourage you to check that out. Now you might ask, where do I find this blog? Well, and I'm getting some crazy bar coming up here, which is irritating. Um, you can go to our wiki page. Our wiki page is a wealth of information. And from that wiki page, we have a link to the blog. We also have a link to the YouTube channel, whereas recordings from training such as this one will eventually appear. If you go to the blog, um, you'll see that we've got all these different posts 
you can click on the one that most piques your interest. And you'll see that then we've got um, a Python notebook that's been exported to HTML where it sort of works through um, an example of a particular, uh, of what that topic is about. In this case, this is one about subplots. It's a very useful one. And it goes through all the basics in order to, to um, configure your subplots, um, which is great. So most of them are based on Python. So sorry for anyone who, who doesn't use Python. There are a couple of examples on that blog that do cover R as well. Another thing to point out is that um, if, you, if you Google data visualization, there's so many different resources online. Um, but we've found um, a number of useful links that um, do cover um, worked examples, um, either in Matplotlib, Cartapy, um, or a whole range of different Python packages that can be very useful for you um, to understand, okay, how do I create a particular type of figure? And I think I've got one of these already open that I really um, quite like, and that's this Python graph gallery. And what's nice about this is that you can look at, okay, what kind of plot do I wanna create? Um, and how do I go about doing it? Um, and you can click in on an example and it'll give you, um, not only um, the code used to generate that type of plot, um, as well as the finished product, but um, that can save you a lot of time in terms of how do I um, implement all the, all the little tweaks that are necessary in order to, to create a figure as, as pretty as this one. Um, there are a lot of, of different packages out there. Um, and one of the ones that we did talk about last week was matplotlib and this one has a lot of worked examples that you can go through if you want to understand a bit better how you can utilize um, a particular function. Cartapy was one that we also talked about last week. Um, this is really important if you're going to be um, plotting spatial data where you, you need to include geographic information um, and there are a range of different projections there. And then there's Seaborn as well. Um, this is one that I've used um, every now and then. Seaborn is really quite powerful because it does a lot of these um, little tweaks that can make beautiful plots, um, but with very little effort on your part. Um, and that can be quite advantageous. So um, all of those links are provided in this notebook. So you can, can go and, and have a look at those um, at your own leisure. Um, I did want to cover a little bit um, of my own best practice tips. Um, I really just want to put a disclaimer out there to say that this is not an exhaustive list. There's probably some things that I have left off. Um, but these are the things that really come to mind for me. Um, the first one is about colour. So often we're plotting maps of data and we need to have some kind of colour map. Um, in order to differentiate the values of our data. And um, sometimes um, we might use the default color map that might look like a rainbow. In fact, um, matplotlib um, has a whole page about different color maps that are available um, in that package. And there's quite a lot to choose from, but Sometimes we might just pick something random without really thinking about how an individual is supposed to interpret those colors. And um, that's where um, Color Brewer is a really powerful tool that can help you quickly visualize what a particular color scheme might look like. So um, Color Brewer is actually something that I've only really used um, more myself in, in recent times. Um, but what's advantageous about Color Brewer is that, well, one, I can see it, but I can select this colorblind safe option. And what that does is it'll exclude all the color schemes that are not friendly for people who are colorblind. Um, I'm not colorblind myself, but I can imagine that for someone who is, if they encountered um, a color scheme where it's not colorblind friendly, um, how would they actually know? Um, in sequential colour schemes, that's not really so much a problem, but it is a problem when you're looking at diverging colour schemes where you're trying to um, convey some information um, about the magnitude of um, an anomaly, for example, um, by using colour colours um, to help with that interpretation. 
So uh, if I deselect this colorblind safe option, you'll see that there, there's um, some color bars um, that reappear and one of them is this traffic light one. So traffic lights, most people know what a traffic light is. Green is go um, and, and red is stop. Um, one way that one might use this kind of color scheme is if you're trying to communicate something about error. So um, green would mean good and red would mean bad. But the problem is, is that if you're colorblind, you're not necessarily going to be able to differentiate between the reds and the greens. And therefore, it's not the best color scheme to be using. So you can select this colorblind safe mode and that will highlight to you what color maps are safe for colorblind people. Um, other features that are available from Color Brewer is that you can actually download um, a little file and, and use these numbers to create your own distinctive color maps. It's not necessarily the case if you're using Python that you would need to do that, but it's nice to know that the option's there if you want to create some wild and crazy um, color scheme. Another thing to sort of say about color is that, uh, which I've already sort of alluded to, is that it can be quite powerful in helping uh, a reader to interpret your results. So um, if we're link, thinking about temperature data, um, this red to blue scheme is quite a powerful one because red, I think it's warm and it's hot and blue, I think cold, um, cold, cooling um, and, and low temperatures, for example. Um, so if I'm plotting temperature data um, and, and this is just an example, then it would make it really fast for uh, a reader to interpret what they're seeing. But uh, you just want to be careful that you've got sort of um, uh, the right order so that blues are for your low temperature values and reds are for your high temperature values. Another example um, of, of um, doing this um, would be for precipitation data. So I often use um, a brown to green color map if I'm looking at precipitation data. Um, I do have a background in land surface science. So for me, um, brown means dry and green means lush vegetation. If I'm more in the atmospheric sciences, I might prefer to use blue instead of green, um, where the blue would indicate wetter conditions. Um, up to you, depends on, on what your foci is. Um, a final thing to say about colour maps, and I know I'm labouring on that quite a bit, but it is really important, is that, you know, how um, it, you can see in this colour map, it includes white. And an important question you need to ask is how are people supposed to interpret white? Um, does it mean that um, the values are zero, that there's no data? Um, it's a bit ambiguous. Um, you can sort of resolve that by having an even number of, of colour classes so that white is not included. Um, and that's quite advantageous if you have um, a diverging scheme. So you're, you're plotting, say, precipitation anomalies where um, all the, the brown hues um, are negative um, precipitation anomalies and all the green hues are positive uh, precipitation anomalies. And then it's clear that the, the lighter shades, they are values close to zero, but they're not zero itself. Um, so hopefully um, some of the things I'm saying um, do make sense. So um, another thing to really think about is, is how we um, plot our data. Um, and say if I was looking at, at global data, um, the, the coastline map that I use would probably depend upon what I'm interested in. So as I mentioned, I've done a lot of stuff on the land surface, so I don't really care about the oceans, um, sorry. Um, but often when I'm plotting global data, I will use this map on, on the left here so that I'm, I'm not splitting up the continents, instead I'm splitting up the Pacific Ocean. In contrast, if I was really interested in, in what's happening over the oceans, particularly over the Pacific Ocean, I'd prefer to use um, set up my global maps to look like the one on the right here so that the Pacific Ocean is complete. Um, equally, if I was interested in the Indian Ocean, the same thing. Um, it's perhaps not so great for the South um, Atlantic, so maybe I would then instead prefer um, setting up my plots like the one on the left here. Um, equally, if I'm interested in the Southern Ocean, I'm not entirely sure this kind of projection is what I would want to use. And I would probably check out what's available uh, 
on the um, various different projections that are available for Carter Pi and, and use a projection that is appropriate to the region that I'm looking at. But it's just something to keep in mind. Some of you may be working with global data to think a little bit about, you know, where, where are you splitting things up? Are you doing it over an ocean basin or um, over a continental area? And that will depend upon what your focus is actually on. A final thing that I want to say is that, you know, there is certainly a temptation to have lots of different um, labels and everything uh, on our plots um, and complicate them. And um, I'm not sure if I have an example open for you to demonstrate that point. Actually, I do. That's great. Um, borrowing from one of my colleagues, um, particularly when you've got subplots, um, you can sort of take advantage of the fact that if you've got common axes, you can reduce the need to have redundant information. So what do I mean when I'm saying that? What I mean is that, you know, it could have been possible in this um, subplot figure that each subplot would have the latitude and longitude labels on every single one of them. But because that information is technically the same for um, each of these panels, it's far better to actually remove that redundant information and instead only include that on, on the outer axes um, of these subplots. And also in this case, by fixing um, the limits, um, color limits um, and data range, so that you just need one color bar rather than four. There are instances where that might not quite work, but it's sometimes quite advantageous to um, limit how much of that uh, redundant information you're including so that um, you, you don't have as much white space between your subplots and therefore these panels can be larger and it can be easier for a reader to see them. Wow, that was a lot of different things to cover on, on the best practice. So now let's go through um, some um, examples. So um, these are drawing from um, research that's currently in review. It may very well be the case that there'll be further tweaks to these plots. Um, and I'm not really going to tell you anything about how I process my data or anything like that. If you're interested, um, feel free to contact me. Um, I just want to focus on um, how I actually produced um, each plot. Um, just briefly, what is this plot that I'm showing you? So this is um, a model output from an experiment I ran at a very high resolution over Sydney um, in order to evaluate the urban heat island effect. Um, the urban heat island effect, not all of you ne might necessarily know what that means. Um, basically, it's the case where urban areas tend to be uh, a lot hotter than their um, surrounding um, rural locations because there's a lot more thermal mass in the built environment. Um, and this um, is some data that I've then extracted um, along an east-west transect of the model domain. And I've done that because I want to get a sense of sort of how things are changing um, along the same line of latitude and how it varies um, through the lowest five kilometres of the atmosphere. Um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm evaluating the urban heat island, so it's a temperature difference or the temperature anomaly um, as a result of the urban environment. And so here, red means it's hotter, blue uh, means it's cooler. And um, one thing to sort of note on this colour bar, at least, is that um, I've got arrows here rather than a flat line. The reason for that is that if there are any values exceeding um, the limits here, um, it will still be coloured in this colour. Um, it is the case in some programming languages that if you, if you don't do that, um, any um, pixels or whatever that you have um, exceeding that limit will just be shaded white. Um, fortunately, Python does not do that. Um, but it's just something to, to be mindful of um, that, that that arrow um, might seem trivial, but that helps in terms of the interpretation that there can be higher values and they're just coloured all the same colour. Another thing to note is that I've included um, this black silhouette here, and that's the topographic profile along that line of um, latitude. That's something because I was quite interested in understanding um, sort of I guess providing some context on where the, the topography, in this case the Blue Mountains, lies and, and what that looks like over Sydney itself. Um, and that's something that I think a lot of atmospheric scientists might like to do, but also oceanographers, if they're looking at sort of um, a transect 
um, across an ocean basin, they'd probably want to include the bathymetry. And you can use a technique similar to this one in order to achieve that. The final thing is that then I've added this colour strip along the bottom, and that's just to denote the surface type. Uh, so green is vegetation, grey is urban, and blue is ocean. So how did I get there? I'm not going to run through these cells um, today, but obviously I, I import some packages. Um, I then go to read in my data. Um, these are invariant fields um, from my model, so the land use. Um, every model has um, a land use classification scheme that says where, what, where are the trees, where's the grass, and so on and so forth. Um, the longitudes, and in this case, just along the line of latitude to which I've extracted the data. And then the terrain height uh, as well. It's probably called something different in every model. Um, and in this case, um, it's, I just um, describe it as HDT. Once I've read in the land use information, I then just basically convert all the um, different, they have um, numbers, um, but it is categorical data, but I just instead create a list where uh, instead of all those numbers, I either give it um, the character of L for, for vegetation, probably should have been V. Um, I know what my um, uh, value corresponds to water bodies. In this case, it's 17, and that's my O for oceans. And everything else um, is um, the urban um, surface types, and that's U's as denoted as U. I then read in my data. As I said earlier, this is data that I've already processed. But the temperature data is actually the temperature difference between two different experiments. So it's, um, I guess, an anomaly rather than an absolute value. And then I'm also grabbing the atmospheric height um, level information as well. Now let's have a look at this plot function. There's a lot of different elements within that. And let's hopefully get through as much as we can. So as per usual, um, we, um, well, we define our function and we have some input arguments. In this case, the, the temperature data, um, the height level data, the longitudes, um, the terrain height and my land use list. And then I have an optional argument to sort of, this will set the limits um, to which I'm plotting the data and it will default to plus or minus one, but a user can change that if they wanted to. We then import the packages. So these are two packages or rather matplotlib is one that people um, are often using and we use this abbreviation PLT. The next two packages come from Matplotlib, and these two are, are what I use in order to create discrete um, color bars rather than a continuous color bar. And um, we'll, I'll show you sort of how one actually does it um, shortly. Um, I've got a little bit of garbage here, I guess, from previous code that I've, I've used, um, but it's more to sort of say that um, the way I've set up this plot that I'm showing you, I've actually, um, you can do it where the color bar is part of that subplot, but more often than not, when I'm doing um, plots, I tend to prefer having the color bar as its own sort of subplot um, object. And that's because maybe I have many subplots and I just want to have one color bar rather than say four, um, or maybe I want to um, do some extra tweaks to it. And um, uh, this is the way that I've found works for me. As always, there are many ways to do things in Python. So basically I, I um, create a figure and I specify the size. Um, I create my first um, subplot axes um, and that's for the main um, panel plot. And then I also create um, another subplot axis, and that's the one that I use for the color bar. Um, the main thing to note here would be that this is where I can then really sort of squeeze the size of that um, color bar to being something that is desirable, either making it fatter or, or more narrow, up to you. The next step is that um, the input arguments that I've provided of the longitude and the heights, these are 1D arrays, but if I'm wanting to use something like contour F to plot my data, ideally you wanna have two dimensional arrays. So for the longitudes, I'm just repeating that for every atmospheric level, but for um, the heights, uh, I'm, I'm doing a little bit more than just that. And that's because I want to account for the fact that I've got terrain height. And I know that in the model that I'm using, 
in the lower atmospheric levels, um, the you have terrain following um, vertical levels. And so I'm adjusting the height levels to account for um, the top topography um, here. Hopefully everyone's following me because I can't I can't see anyone. But um, if you have any questions, feel free to jump in as well. The next part is is then um, defining um, the discrete levels for our color bar, and that's where I'm using this max and locator um, function in order to do that. You need to specify the number of bins. Um, so here I often use an even number, and I'm either using ten, um, but more often um, twenty, so that I have. Um, I guess, enough discrete colours in my colour bar. So you'll notice, if I just flick up to the figure again, that we've got um, um, 10 distinctive colours. It's, it's um, you know, changes from red to blue um, at zero. That's intentional. Um, we can then put in our maximum min value. It's defaulting to one in this case. Um, we then need to um, extract um, the sort of, color values from our color map corresponding to those levels um, and boundary norm makes that um, task easy, which is advantageous. Um, and then the next thing is I'm plotting the data here. Um, so I'm using contour F in this instance. Um, the data here is very high resolution. Um, so I don't necessarily think there'd be much difference whether I'm using contour, of, contour F or P color mesh. But um, in this instance, I decided to use contour F. So I need to provide my, my two-dimensional um, X and Y values. And then I've got um, my 2D array of the temperature differences. And then I'm specifying here the max and min values um, to which I want um, the color map to be bounded by. Um, I specify the color map seismic in this case. Um, if I wanted to reverse this so that instead of going from red to blue, which is what I've shown, I wanted to make it go from blue to red, it's just a matter of, of adding an underscore R um, to, to flip that in case that's something you wanted to do. Um, I then include um, the levels and the norm that I've just calculated above. And then I include this extend both so that I get a, a triangle um, or these arrows rather on the, on the color bar than a flat line. And that, that produces then just this, this um, you know, red and blue shading of the temperature difference. That's so not including the silhouette or this color um, strip on the bottom. So how do I go about doing those? Um, well, firstly, let's, let's be, you know, we need to be diligent in how we're creating our plots. So we should always be labeling our axes and, and providing a, tape, um, a title as well. Um, in this case, um, I'm only providing the y-axis label, I'm specifying that it's a height um, and the title. You will note that I didn't include um, a label um, for the x-axis. That was a personal preference of mine because in the figure caption, I do explain um, what exactly um, that corresponds to. But if you wanted to be um, you know, diligent about these things, you could add um, an x label there as well to indicate that it's a longitude and in, in degrees east. To create that black silhouette, um, I use something called fill between. Fill between, you need to provide the X values and then you need to provide two Y values. Um, and so in this way, then um, I'm providing the topographic height and then otherwise um, the second lot of Y values, um, I, I'm just setting that equal to um, zero. I'm specifying that I want it to be black in color. I could pick something else, but black, it, I think, is tends to be a preference in doing something like this. And interpolate true just um, ensures that it looks smooth rather than blocky. So that's how you create this black silhouette of the topographic uh, profile. Hopefully no one's getting too, too dizzy when I'm scrolling back and forth here. The next thing is to add that um, strip along the bottom about the different um, land use types. And what I do is I create little dictionaries so that um, anytime uh, there's an L, it's green. Anytime there's an O, it's blue. And anytime it's U, it's green. Um, and then just sort of create um, a new list, which is called C. I wasn't very imaginative um, in this instance. Um, 
where I take all those sort of land use or that list of um, L, O and U's and just instead create a list of the corresponding colours. And then I just create a scatter plot um, where the X values are then the longitudes. Um, I do provide the Y value, but that's constant for every um, longitude value. And then the colour, this in the end is a list, right? So that, you know, each marker has a distinct colour, although because I have a lot of repetition, right, there's lots of green and lots of um, blue as well, then it, um, it alternates that. And I've just specified that the marker is um, a square. So it's not that I've actually drawn a line here. It's just that I've drawn a whole lot of square markers and colored those square markers um, according to the surface type from my land use classification. Um, and I had a preference for that because particularly um, in, in some areas, you do have a bit of transition that there, there might be a bit more green uh, or more vegetation um, than in the urban. So once I've done that, um, another handy hint um, is that, I mean, I've added uh, labels to the X axis, but I'm not including all the values. So as I've mentioned, it's really high resolution data. If I included all the longitude values along that X axis, this axis would be hard to read. It would just be black because there's that many different values. So rather than doing that, I've just sampled at a regular interval the longitude values so that you at least get a sense that these are increasing from left to right, but it's, I'm not cluttering up that axis so that you cannot read it. Um, the other thing I've done is I've rotated them because if I had them horizontal, um, they would overlap and that would make it hard to, to read. At the same time, though, if, if someone wants to read this, maybe they're going to turn turn their head on the side. And that's something to think about, at least if you're doing presentations, um, that you want your labels to be oriented so that it is easy for people to read. If you see people um, when you're giving a talk, turn their, their heads to the side. Um, maybe that's a sign to, to change the orientation of your labels. Another thing that I've, I've done is I've, I've fixed the uh, Y limit axis. So um, I've limited it to just below um, zero to include that color strip of the land surface type. And I've then uh, the maximum value I've limited to five. The data itself actually goes to quite high up in the atmosphere. Um, but I only wanted to look at the lower atmosphere because that's where the most interesting things actually happen. And then I add my color bar, um, but I've done it on a separate um, subplot. Um, and in this case, this example, there's not a lot of tweaks I've done to that um, color bar in terms of spacing and width. I do have an example later on for you, if we get time to it, um, or if not, um, it's definitely there. So that's everything on that example. Um, I mean, does anyone have any questions before I continue to my next example? It's silent, so I'm gonna... Uh, presume that everyone's happy. Um, so the next example um, is one about how you go about adding um, some stippling to your plot. What is stippling? So um, it's quite common in climate science that we might produce a map of some data. Um, on the left column, uh, we've got some observational data and in the right column, we're showing in this case, um, uh, an ensemble mean estimate from CMIP6, uh, and it's the difference between CMIP6 and our observational data, so it's a bias. And we've got color shading indicating the magnitude of that bias for a number of different variables. The different variables are in, in different rows, but we still want to indicate something about the significance of those biases. Um, statistical significance is a big uh, topic of discussion. So I don't think that's something we would, would cover today, but if there's interest could be done later on. Um, but I've um, added this hatching and, and that hatching in this example is just indicating where the majority of these CMIP6 models agree on the sign of the bias. So that's advantageous to give a sense of, of when there is model agreement or when there's really high uncertainty. And I'm using this hatching it's not very densely um, spaced because I don't want to obscure the data. Um, if, if 
if it's too densely spaced, um, particularly when they're this size, it can be really hard to then interpret the values of the shading uh, or the colour schemes um, themselves. If you want to know more about different hatching styles, um, matplotlib is great. It has lots of examples of different hatching styles. It's quite common that people will use something like this, um, these dots. Um, I've been using um, uh, these um, hatchings uh, as X's instead. And what's really nice about this, at least in Python, is it's very easy to change the density of the spacing. And all you do is that um, if you want to make it more dense, um, in this case, I'm just focusing on, on the X, instead of just having one X, you could write three X's and that would increase um, how dense those lines are. They'd be closely um, spaced together. Um, I think other software languages um, that I have used don't make it that easy. Um, Python makes it that easy. It's great. Love it. So um, how do we go about um, creating this multi-paneled subplot that I've just shown? Um, Probably be going through it a little bit more quickly. Again, we're just read, reading through the packages we need to, to read in our data. Um, I want to highlight one that's called region mask. Um, this package is great for creating land sea masks um, at the resolution to which your data is at. So if you don't have a land sea mask for the data set you're working with, region mask may very well be um, the answer to your problems. We then read in um, data that I've already processed. In this case, um, we need some information about um, the coordinates, so the latitudes and longitudes. I've got something called BE mean. I, I know what that means. Um, and that just stands for Berkeley Earth, and it's the mean. Um, Berkeley Earth is an observational data set that um, many of us do use. Um, and then the bias that I've calculated and um, an array uh, that um, basically consists of zeros and ones, and that's what I use um, to um, indicate significance and to add hatching um, to my plot. Um, then just define um, uh, a new X-array data set of the latitude longitude coordinates, and then I can use that um, along with region mask um, to create a land sea mask at the resolution of my data. And in this instance, um, because um, I'm doing multiple panel um, plots. I'm just repeating um, that mask to the same um, dimensions as um, what I've got for my data. And then I apply the mask and then I get ready to, to plot my data. So we have um, in this function then a number of different input arguments. So the latitude and longitude, my observed data, row data, my model data, my significance, I've included variable labels. Um, and then I've got um, these three different variables just correspond to access limits uh, for the color bars um, themselves and figure name. Again, um, the packages we're importing are similar to what I've shown in my first example, but in this case, because um, we're wanting to plot the world, we're including um, Carter Pi. And another one uh, that is quite useful is that um, because I've got a multiple panel plot, you do need to label each of those panels. Um, and, and often the way we're doing that is we're iterating through the alphabet. So A, B, C, D, so on and so forth. Um, string um, ASCII lowercase makes this very easy. You don't need to hard code it. And it's very easy to write a loop in order to iterate through the alphabet. Um, we are running short of time, but um, I'll just maybe focus on the things that are really um, different in this example. One thing that you can do is you can specify the DPI to which you're saving your figure at. And this is really handy because um, for a journal publication, you probably want to save it at a very high DPI so that the figures look crisp and clear. And you probably also want to do that um, if you're going to use that figure in a talk. But um, that means then that the figure file size can get really big. Um, by several megabytes. And that might not be ideal if you're just doing quick figures that you want to share with your supervisor, your colleagues, and so on and so forth. So you can specify um, the save DPI, make it lower uh, for lower resolution figures, set it higher for higher resolution um, figures. 
So we, we do set up our, um, our figure space. We use subplots um, and we already um, define how many subplot axes we've got. Um, in this case, I've got four different variables and I've got two columns because one is observed and one is the model bias. And I've just sort of written a little hack that the figure size will scale with how many rows and columns that I've got. This is just, um, if you already know what the aspect ratio is for one plot, then you can use this to make it um, a lot faster to, to make sure the aspect ratio um, looks nice for your um, figure. And then because I'm, I'm plotting uh, global data, I'm then including um, this keyword arg argument with um, the projection information, where in this case I've specified a central uh, longitude of zero um, because I don't want to split up the continents, I want to split up the Pacific Ocean. We define our colour maps that we're using. Um, both of these don't include white in it and the reason for that is that I've masked the oceans and the default um, when you're doing Python plotting is that any, any masked areas will be plotted as white. Um, it used to be that you could specify the colour, but I think that's just become deprecated quite recently. Um, again, I'm using contour F um, to plot each of those panels. Um, and the arguments are similar to what I've done before. Um, although I'm actually calculating um, the levels um, in this call. Um, and I've specified the number of bins. In this case, I've used 10. And um, that's the same both for the observational data and the model data. And um, uh, then what I do is I'm adding stippling, but only to the second column where I'm showing the model bias. And so again, I can use contour F um, to do that. Um, I provide the latitude and longitude um, values in two dimensions. I have my significance variable that consists of zeros and ones. Um, I indicate that I only have one level, that I don't want the contours to be filled, and instead I want there to be hatches. So anywhere um, there are zeros, I'm saying no hatching, and anywhere there are um, values of one, there is hatching of x's. The reason I just point that out is that it's possible that you can, um, if you want to differentiate between not just um, zeros and ones, but zeros, ones, and minus ones, um, it would just be a matter of having two levels and then maybe specifying something um, ahead of this um, none. I then add the coastlines. Um, you can actually change the resolution of those coastlines. In this case, I'm just using a default value. Um, I then add um, uh, labels to each of the subplots, and this is just iterating through the alphabet. So I use this dot text um, command in order to do that. And so you need to specify an X and Y value. Um, that can be a bit hard if, if, because unless you use this argument here, transform is equal to the, the axes, transaxes, then these values will correspond to um, what's in the data itself rather than um, the sort of axes itself. So by using this transform um, with the transaxes argument, then these X and Y positions are just need to be in the range of zero to one. You can play around with the alignment um, in relation to that position. Um, I just stick to the bottom left, but um, you could change that to something else if that's um, desired. Another thing that you can do here is you can specify the font weight and the font size. So that's ideal if you want to make it clear, like legible. So by default, the, the labels won't be bold and they might not always be the right size. So they might be very hard for someone to see, in which case um, you can make them bold and increase the font size so that people can read them. And then, um, this part here is just indicating, well, what is the label actually going to be? And this is where I'm using that um, string of the alphabet and um, I iterate through it. So VIND is something that um, I've, sorry, I didn't actually explain that. I'm actually looping through the variables here. So I, I started at this index at um, zero, but then I increment it by one every time I've added a label to a plot. 
Other things that I've done in this figure is that I've added row labels. I've done that because rather than um, add all that information in, in here and potentially obscure the data, where there's sort of um, commonality, I guess, um, I've instead then added labels that then apply across the rows. So for the rows, at least, then it's the same variable and I provide the variable acronym, which is defined more explicitly um, in my figure caption, as well as the units of that variable. Um, and likewise for the columns, although for the columns, I, I just use set title in order to do it. And again, it's a matter of you can specify the font size, the font weight, um, you can play around with the rotation if you so choose to. Um, there's a lot that you can really um, customize. Finally, um, yeah, I'm adding the color bars. Um, so in this case, because it's different variables um, and different ranges for each panel, then each panel has its own subplot. I couldn't sort of generalize that in this instance. Um, and then the final thing that I do is I do adjust the white space between those subplot panels so that um, I don't have too much white space. So I've tried to make the white space as small as possible without sort of overlapping the figures. Um, if you wanted to um, get rid of it all together, you would set um, W space and H space to zero. Um, in this case, not something that I would do, but I try to make it as small as possible. So that's an example of one using subplots and labeling and, and adding um, some hatching there for statistical significance. So um, does anyone have any questions about that at all? Maybe it's information overload. <laughs> um, I do have one other example um, to, to go through. I don't think I've really got enough time to go through it in any depth. Um, but, um, you know, quite often we're wanting to add um, legends to our plots. That's particularly pertinent if you've got time series of uh, different model realizations. Um, my advice there would be you don't want the legend positioned in such a way that it's obscuring your data. And sometimes it's advantageous to stick the legend outside of um, the subplot space. And, and that is very easy to do, but I won't explain all the specifics about that um, due to us running uh, low on time. Another one is that you can create your own color maps. This is something I've only just figured out how to do myself where I'm combining two different color maps. And sometimes you might want to do that because the options that are available in matplotlib don't suit your needs. Um, and so in this case, um, this map here is just showing um, surface type where the greens correspond to different vegetation classes and the grays correspond to different urban classes. And the crux of that code is that you, you, you read in two different color maps um, you stack them together and matplotlib.colors, um, uh, I've imported that as a, a package that I've then abbreviated to mcolors. And it has a function where you can um, basically combine um, those two color maps um, together. And that's really nice. That's how I created these two together because I couldn't find a color map that suited my purpose in that instance. And I think I will, I will finish there. Um, I might stop sharing my screen and welcome people to ask questions. <laughs>